So, good evening, everyone. Welcome to everyone here in the Quarry White House Auditorium at Sewin, and everyone joining us online as well. You are equally very welcome. And um, you will see by looking at the headlines each day that it is a turbulent world at the moment with the Middle East and Ukraine, but also fractured Western democracies, especially at the moment it feels the US and elsewhere. And of course, the way we learn about the world and find out what's happening is through news. Um, and that's the way we try to understand it. But the question increasingly people ask is, can we trust the news? I was doing a, a session on misinformation this week with um, uh, Cambridge University alumni, and a number of Cambridge alumni were putting into the chat, they just don't believe what they see and hear these days. So um, is that right or not? And we have the perfect guest tonight to answer that kind of question in Ros Atkins, who is the analysis editor at the BBC. And you'll see him on screen and hear him on uh, the radio and see him online rather a lot. Um, I, I confess I first became aware of Ross when he was doing um, uh, uh, Outside Source in the uh, mid-2010s. And I wrote a piece which I think you thought was mildly pejorative when I talked about an energetic chap with a touch screen. Um, but I think it, it, was it was mildly pejorative, wasn't it? <laughs> it was intended to be mildly complimentary. And when I, when I wrote my own book uh, uh, a year or so ago, I did single out Ross as being one of the people who really was doing an extraordinary job in BBC News and trying something new. And I think you can't underestimate the extent to which the explainers that Ros do, uh, does were seen as being a bit sidebar, a bit um, sort of marginal. And then really uh, three or four years ago, they started picking up very large audiences and very large online audiences. And then the BBC, which always spots a good thing, um, reckoned that was the kind of thing they wanted more of in television news bulletins. So Ros has really um, pioneered some of the explanation about journalism and has got a duly prominent place because of that. So uh, we're talking tonight partly because he's got um, a book out called The Art of Explanation, and you'll see there are some copies lurking outside. He also presents uh, Radio 4's media show, and I'm going to talk to Ros for maybe 20 minutes or so, and then we'd love you to come in and ask your questions. And if you're watching online, you can send in email questions if you're watching live to master at cell.cam. Dot ac dot UK, so that's master at sel dot cam dot ac dot UK, and we'll make sure we have plenty of time for questions. So, um, Ros, if we can start about why don't people trust the news so much? And it's one reason simply that we, as a country, we as a series of societies, are more fractured and polarised than we used to be. Evening. Hi everyone, thanks very much indeed for, thanks very much to all of you for coming out, I'm very flattered to see so many of you. Um, I might turn that question back on you though slightly Roger, which is, I don't think we can state, you know, why do people not trust the news? Some people we know have reservations about the news, others we know trust certain news organisations more than others. So you're quite right that the downward trend in trusted news uh, exists and is undeniable. And just, just to give Go a on. figure on that, the BBC between 2018 and 2022 mm -hmm. had a 20% fall in people who said they trusted it. So it went from 75% to 55%. Still the most trusted news outlet in Britain, but quite a big fall. Yes, and I don't think you'll find anyone in BBC News or in any big news organisation who wouldn't say that, that trust is a, is a challenge for all journalists and all news organisations. In terms of why it's happening, well, it's a complex... Uh, issue to take on. It seems to me, and it's a statement of the obvious, that we're all receiving information from a greater diversity of sources than would have been the case even 10 years ago, and certainly uh, when I was a student here in Cambridge, much more than I would have been able to receive 30 years ago. And as we receive information from a range of sources, some of which are definitely not reliable, some of which are at the more reliable end of the scale, I think that more broadly, our degree of scepticism that we apply to all information coming at us increases. And as such, I think that means that people don't simply say, this information comes from here, I automatically trust it in the same way that they might have done uh, a while ago. So there's no, there's no doubting that, that that's going on. It also seems to me, and I, I find this in my own personal experience, that because of the speed at which technology is developing, both in terms of the information it generates and the information it distributes, all of us 
have to take more care over the information that we're receiving. If I'm on social media, if someone who I may think is a reliable source shares an image, these days I would still want to double check that that image is also being shared by other reliable sources because we need to be, you know, these images could have been generated in ways that means that we can't be sure of them. And so I think for understandable reasons, people are needing to stop and think about the veracity of the information they're, they're getting. And I think that, that trust is inevitably being affected by that. I would say, though, that the work that we at the BBC and others are doing to try and counter that, well, there's a number of things that we can do, but our relatively new CEO, Deborah Turness, who's been in that role for about uh, a year or so, is repeatedly putting emphasis on our need to share more of the work that we do so that people know that the reason we're saying something, we're not saying, trust this because it's coming from us, though of course we hope you will, but we're also saying, trust this because we're going to show you why we've reached this conclusion. And so there's a lot of emphasis now on journalists doing more to, to show their workings, if you like, in an effort to say pe to people, look, you can see what we've done, and this is why we believe it's trustworthy. But on, on the polarisation point, if we look at one of the most difficult issues and the tragedy happening in the Middle East at the moment, you do have um, some people who absolutely defend of course, Israel's right to exist, and then other people who see Israel as being a colonialist or settler people. And you can't bridge that, can you? So th those t different people are going to distrust mainstream media for different reasons if they don't think they're following exactly the line that they happen to believe. I think on this story and on a number of stories I've covered as a, as a BBC News anchor, you will accept that however hard you try to cover the story accurately and fairly, not everyone is going to be satisfied by what you say. I think that's inevitable. In the end, though, it's our job to both be factual and fair, but also to help our audiences understand the different perspectives of the events that are happening now or the events that happened in the past, and we work incredibly hard to, to make that so. But I certainly, when I'm covering this story or covering other stories, understand that despite my best efforts and the BBC's best efforts to be fair and factual and all the things that you would expect from us, not everyone is necessarily going to agree with where we end up. And you mentioned social media. I, I, we can't really avoid um, X or Twitter or whatever we now want to call it. And th there are multiple problems with X and Twitter, aren't there, which is um, compressing views into a small number of characters. There's the sheer volume of information coming in at times. The fact that the information on um, Twitter or X is often very partisan. You can read it sometimes and think, well, that must be happening, and actually the opposite is the truth. So, I mean, do you find social media actually a barrier to trying to get to truth? I don't think social media is a barrier. I think the internet and social media has given us access to a range of sources that we wouldn't otherwise have had access to, and that is, as a journalist who's always looking for more information, more sources to help us understand our world, I think there's still huge value. Would we, if we said, if we could just click our fingers and get rid of the internet and get rid of social media and get rid of the technology we use, would we all choose to, to reverse that? I don't know if we would. I think that what is definitely true is that the volume of information coming at us can feel overwhelming and it can be quite hard to know where to start. And to your point, Roger, as that information comes towards us, because it's being generated by algorithms, to some extent that information is being dictated by the platforms that we're on. So you can get a certain position or you can get another position. And I think as a journalist, one of the things that I am very mindful of, and certainly my colleagues at BBC News are mindful of too, is if you are getting one perspective from social media, whether it's on Twitter or elsewhere, to double check and to start looking in other information ecosystems to see how one experience in one part of the digital world compares with another. So, of course, you need to be cautious. Of course, you need to be skeptical at times about what you're seeing and what you're hearing. But I wouldn't go as far as saying there's no information of value. I think there is information of value, but journalists ever since there have been journalists, it's always been our job to look at a range of sources coming from a range of places and to assess the reliability and the helpfulness of that information. That work has changed where it's happening, 
but the fundamentals of journalism, I think, actually remain the same. OK, you say the fundamentals of journalism remain the same, but isn't it also true that the mainstream media, as it is sometimes called, is also becoming more polarised? So I, I would say that The Guardian is more left than it used to be and The Telegraph is more right than it used to be. So you're finding that what used to be mainstream fact-checked organisations are dallying a bit with partisanship and maybe a more selective form of journalism. I wonder how you measure that. Oh, it's a very good question. I, I suppose that I think sometimes there are stories which, if you look at an agenda, 20 years ago, the agenda of The Guardian and Telegraph would be largely similar. They take a different take on it. Whereas you can now, a bit like Fox and MSNBC in America, you see agendas which don't coincide at all and some views which are clearly problematic for The Guardian or problematic for The Telegraph and they don't therefore feature them. Well, again, I'd want to try and measure the, the, the hypothesis that you're putting forward, but let's, for a minute, suggest that you're right, that The Guardian's position now is different to where it was, or The Telegraph's position is different to where it was. Nonetheless, when I was a student across town in the 1990s and would go to the newsagent and think, which newspaper am I going to buy today, I would still be knowing, as I bought those newspapers, that those newspapers were bringing certain perspectives. And so I think the fact that whenever we are using different information sources within the news media or more broadly within the information ecosystems we operate in, you always have to factor in the perspectives. You always have to think, well, what is this source and what is it bringing to this particular story? Yeah, these sources may evolve, but I'm not sure uh, the fundamentals of stop and think, what is this information serving? What's the purpose of the publication? All of these questions we would have asked years ago, yeah, you have to ask them now, but that's, that's not new. And what about the BBC here, where if you look at Let's take America as the example. Would you say that most BBC people are probably in favour of gun control and in favour of abortion rights and probably don't think the Hunter Biden story is much of a story and think Trump is pretty ghastly? And therefore, if you're not careful, don't you end up with the BBC being on one side of a political debate when actually in America you want to present yourself as being impartial as you do here? I've got no idea what my BBC colleagues think. You really don't think most BBC people... I've got no idea what my control. BBC colleagues think. I don't talk to them about their opinions. I don't talk to them about my opinions. Lots of people, I mean, Andrew Marr said the BBC's uh, very liberal. Uh, I, I have sometimes thought the BBC was uh, quite liberal. It's generally a, a consensus, I think, that the BBC is not politically biased, but it does tend to be on the liberal side of social issues. But this is a theory that I hear. I interviewed Piers Morgan the other day, and he started suggesting that, that this kind of thing is true. I just would like to stop and think, well, first of all, how do, we how do we measure it? How do we measure the opinions of the BBC staff? I'm not aware that there is any way of measuring the BBC staff's opinions. Certainly, I've never been asked for my opinions on anything, and I've been there for over 20 years. The only way you can really judge the BBC is by its output. And if we are going to put together a hypothesis that the BBC is leaning one way or the other, then I'm you know, I would, I would say that I'm not aware of us leaning one way or the other, but I'd need to see the study that, that shows that that's the case one way or the other. OK, well, I'd be interested in other people's views as well, because I, uh, I simply am a facilitator and moderator here. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was going to and interrogator. About, coming on to other reasons why people may not trust the news. And um, in your book, which is um, very good, and I do recommend the book, but you talk at one point about being in Cornwall on assignment, and there was going to be a report looking at the town of Penzance. And you say, great, a report not just on the election, but specifically on Cornwall. You say, I watched the report. My pad remained empty. I'd been shown what the place looked like. I heard the views of a couple of locals, some broad information about the area. But in terms of solid, usable pieces of information, statistics, context analysis, it was slim pickings. Aren't you describing a lot of mainstream media's political content by that? describing that particular report and uh, the... But perhaps it's got wider resonance. Well, resonance. look, there's, there's, I've made no secret of the fact that when we developed Outside Source and I was trying to persuade the BBC of the merits of the format and then once the format was up and running, we were trying to make it, I was as committed as I could be to the idea that if you gave me, for every minute of your time that you gave me, you would get a lot of usable, helpful information in return. And so we use scripting techniques and production techniques to mean that 
for better or for worse, whether you like watching me presenting the news or that particular style of news, you couldn't say to us, we weren't giving you a lot in return for your time. And I felt that in an ever increasing, uh, increasingly competitive environment for people's attention, if you're going to ask people to stop and watch the television for any length of time, whatever TV news program you are, it seemed to me a simple part of the equation that you needed to be giving a lot more in return. And certainly I felt that some TV news was not giving viewers enough in return for the time that they were giving. And, you know, the book goes into it in, in quite some detail, but we developed lots and lots of techniques to try and give those of you watching a lot of helpful information per minute. I hope it's the same for our explainers, but crucially, without it feeling rushed. And so that's the, the, the thing that you've got to do. If you ram everything in so tight that it's just a bit much, you probably don't want to watch it. And so what I was trying to do was create a TV news format that was high protein, to use a phrase I use quite a lot, but was also consumable. Um, and yeah, there was, that wasn't the only report I can think of where I felt that I wasn't getting enough in return for my time. Now, um, I think the kind of things you do are generally exemplary. Thank I really you. do salute them. And also, I love the BBC. I can feel a butt coming here, no, Roger. No, 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 no. I, I worked for BBC for 33 years, so I, I, I'm, I, I love the BBC. But um, the other reason why sometimes people don't believe the news is because of an agenda which they see as being dumbing down. So I took a screenshot this afternoon of the BBC News website, uh, which has Watching the Royals, A History of the Monarchy on screen. It has Snoop Dogg, I've Decided to Give Up Smoke. It's got Megan Hits Red Carpet at Power of Women in Hollywood. I mean, is it justifiable with scarce resource that the BBC is doing those kind of stories? Well, I think asking those kind of questions, you might have wanted to ask one of the top editors from the BBC rather than me along, because needless to say, I have no influence whatsoever on the BBC website. I do think, though, that the BBC, the BBC News needs to make news that feels relevant and interesting to people from across our country, and some people want 10 geopolitical stories, some people want a greater mix of entertainment or uh, royal stories or whatever the example might be. So like any editor, whether it's the person in charge of our website or the person in charge of Outside Source or the person in charge of The Sun or The Telegraph or The Guardian, as you know, Roger, because you've been a senior editor many, for many years, you are constantly making a calculation as to what is the mix of stories that I want to put together. And I'm sure if we went, it would be hard to do, but if we went back through the Five Live running orders from the late 90s when you ran Five Live, we would have found a mix of stories, some very heavy, some lighter. And so editors are always making uh, that mi the calculation about the mix. What I would say, and where... I think I'm agreeing with you, is that we should be absolutely committed to providing serious, in-depth, explanatory coverage of the biggest stories in the world. I would argue the BBC does that. What it does as well as that, we can have a discussion about, but I think the fact that I'm doing the job that I'm doing and that the outside source was commissioned and that my explainers only happen with huge institutional support. I should emphasize that. It's not just uh, me and a couple of producers, though the producers are brilliant. The the explainers rest on the whole organisation. I don't think you could argue the BBC isn't committed to doing the heavier end of the scale when it comes to covering news. Can I ask you about um, the difficulties you have in a job when facts change? And probably the best example of this might be um, face masks during the pandemic, yeah. where at the very beginning, the government and most of the health officials said that you didn't need to wear a face mask. And they actually were worried that you might trap the virus within the face mask. And then, of course, in the middle of the pandemic, it then became mandatory. And I then talked to one of our medics a few months ago saying that for Omicron, that uh, those blue masks were largely pointless because Omicron was so contagious that you didn't need the blue mask. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing an explainer, if people want to know the question, do face masks work? Does that change month by month, depending on what evidence you get? How do you cope with that? Well, I think our understanding of lots of issues, not just issues relating to COVID, do change. I think when I'm putting together an explainer or a coverage or analysis of any given story, to make a point that I made near the start, I'm not saying, hey, tune in and I'm just going to tell you what's what and you've just got to believe me because it's me. I mean, of course not. I'm evidencing all of the things that I'm saying. So if I was offering you some analysis about face masks, it wouldn't be I've worked out what's what with face masks. It would be this is the advice we're getting from the WHO or this is the advice we're getting from the US government or this is the advice we're getting from the UK government. So in some ways, you've got to uh, look across the piece and say, well, here are some 
heavyweight sources of information and we're passing them on to you. But in the end, I'm not drawing a firm conclusion because I'm not a face mask expert. I'm passing on uh, the advice from other experts. But if there was, uh, I mean, I, I'm slightly into hypothetical territory here, but if there was a very uh, heavyweight institute or academic or whatever it might be who was, ch if there was a genuine to and fro about that issue or whatever issue it might be, then of course we should reflect that like we would on any story. How easy is it to say we don't know? I think it's I think it's relatively easy. I mean, I feel like I'm saying I don't know almost every day when I'm when I'm making the news because on any given story you don't have everything. So it would be I mean, in some ways journalism always splits down to this is what we know, this is what we would like to know, and this is what we're very unlikely to be able to find out. It always tends to break down into those three categories. And so if you're in a breaking news scenario, which I do less so now, but for years when I was a 24-hour news presenter, I would do that quite a lot, you'd be rolling on a story and you'd have very little to say initially, and so you would have to do a lot of, at the moment, all we know is this and this, but what we'd like to know is this, 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 and this. And of course, as the story goes on, the, you have more in the column, which you do know, and the number of outstanding questions reduces. But I think it's always worth acknowledging the limits of what you know, partly because it builds trust, because you're being honest about about the process that you're working through because journalism never ends, right? You don't get to a point where you go, this is the definitive answer or take on this particular story. You say, this is where we are at the moment and what you say the next day might be, well, it might well have evolved. So, and the other thing, but this is a broader point, um, I'm a generalist, but even if I weren't, but I'm a generalist, I'm constantly having to admit that I don't know things. Every single day, my working experience involves me ringing up people who know lots about a particular subject and saying, I think I've worked this out, but have I got this right? Or there's an element of this story I don't understand. Can you help? And I think one of the things that you, you need to be to explain anything with credibility, whether it's as a journalist or not, you have to be honest with yourself and with the people you're working with about the limits of your understanding and having the confidence to just say, I just don't get this is, can be, I can remember when I was more junior at the BBC that feeling quite uncomfortable in big editorial meetings. As I get a bit older and greyer, it becomes more comfortable just to say, I, I'm sorry, I'm really confused. My, my friend George Entwistle, who was editor of Newsnight at one point, used to sometimes say in an editorial meeting, it's much more complex than you think it is. And that surely is true of lots of issues today. So if you look at yeah. the way that something like pensions might be reported. It's reported as a political row about whether Jeremy Hunt gives a 7.8% increase or an 8.3% increase and whether we have a triple lock or not. In fact, of course, there are really big issues about the affordability of pensions over 20, 30, 40 years, about intergenerational fairness. How difficult is it to get the latter stories onto a news bulletin as opposed to the knockabout of Prime Minister's questions? Well... As you well know, in news bulletins, time, time is short. So if I'm going on to the 6 and 10 o'clock news, I would normally get between two and, two and three minutes, depending on, the, depending on the allocation that I've been given on my explainers and an outside source. When it was on air, I would have, I would have had more space. Um, I think however long you're given, you need to carve out so, you know, a certain percentage of your reporting for this nuance and this context, because as to, your, to your point, Roger, without it, you can't get a full picture on it. And I think that... Um, there's a kind of there's a twin dynamic that I'm wrestling with when I'm when I'm making our stories, which would seem to be contradictory, but aren't. Which is one, you need to strive to get what you want to say into its simplest form, so that it's as consumable for those of you watching as it possibly can be. But at the same time, in your pursuit of simplicity, you can't compromise on the complexity. You have to look the complexity and nuance in the eye and find ways of translating that complexity into sufficiently simple terms that you can build it into your story. And of course, sometimes that is incredibly difficult if you're given two, two and a half minutes. Sometimes it is possible. The thing that I always do, and perhaps this is useful advice outside of journalism as well, is that I will try my very best to get what I want to say into the space that I've been given, and a lot of the time we can, but if I can't, I'll say so. I'll say the current brief that we've got is too broad for the time that we've got. Could we narrow it so I can do a narrower brief and do it including the complexities and nuance that I want? And that to and fro is normal within journalism. But again, you have to have the confidence to say, I don't think I can take on this issue this wide 
in the space I've got, but I think if we went at a particular dimension of it or a particular element, then I can. And so that's just a constant judgment you're making. Yeah, and, and of course, the, the, the BBC or ITV or Sky News or Channel 4 could spend less time reporting <coughs> knockabout at Westminster that audiences, I think, disengage from, and more time doing your kind of pieces. I mean, you can make an editorial choice. It, it's not the law that you have to report a minor row at PMQs. It's definitely not the law that you have to make television or indeed any type of broadcast however you want. And again, every editor is making judgments about story count, as in how many stories do I give you within a half hour versus how much depth can I give to any individual stories. Now, I'm not about to start providing a commentary on how my colleagues should make their programmes, but with regards to outside source, one of the things that I was committed to when I was suggesting the format to the BBC and then we were making it was we had an hour... And we sometimes did editions of Outside Source on one story if we felt that it warranted it. We would certainly do programmes regularly with three or four stories across an hour. On another day, we might do 15 stories. We were, we were not going to be constrained by any particular duration rule. We were going to judge it on how far into a story we needed to go for that to be helpful. So we gave ourselves that flexibility. But, of course, not all programmes can, can afford that flexibility, and I respect that. But one of the things that I found most rewarding about outside source and also about our explainers which by the way go down to sometimes 60 seconds but will sometimes stretch out to 10 minutes or more is that the duration is set by the requirements of the subject not by anything else okay we would love to have your questions in a moment or two and quite a few are coming in online so if you are watching live online you can email master at sel.cam.ac.uk and I'll put those questions too. Um, just before we do that, um, I, I was sort of slightly grumpily going through, you know, reasons why people may not believe the news anymore. And um, I, I know you're not an editor, so you're not responsible for this, but I, I would just like to ask about... The you're going to ask me anyway. <laughs> I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, a story in the news this week about the BBC's reporting of Israel and the Middle East. So it was based on a Reuters story, and I'm going to read the Reuters story. Reuters said the Israeli military military said its forces were carrying out an operation on Wednesday against Hamas within Gaza's biggest hospital. In a statement, the military said, based on intelligence information and operational necessity, IDF forces are carrying out a precise and targeted operation against Hamas in a specified area of the Shifa hospital. The military said, the IDF forces include medical teams and Arabic speakers who've undergone specified training to prepare for this complex and sensitive environment with the intent that no harm is caused to civilians. Um, a few minutes later on the BBC, the presenter says, at this moment we're hearing from Reuters that's reporting that Israel, it says its forces are carrying out an operation against Hamas in the Al-Shifa hospital, and they are targeting people, including medical teams, as well as Arab speakers. And they go on then to repeat that, saying we're hearing from Reuters that they are targeting Arab speakers as well as some of the medical staff there. How, how does that happen? Well, I don't know how that particular incident happened because I wasn't involved in it at all. I do know that the BBC issued a, uh, an apology and a correction within hours, so clearly it was a, a mistake, but I don't know the, the particular circumstances in which that happened. But is it, is it the pressure of reporting live news? Or a lot of people have said this is the kind of systemic bias that, is, that people like you and me who are in the BBC don't recognise, but there, is, there are systemic biases in the BBC. I can't talk about the circumstances of that particular broadcast at all because I wasn't involved in it. All I can do is reflect on my own experiences and the amount of effort that goes in to every single piece of output that I've been involved in since this war began to make sure it's as fair and accurate and factual as you could be is as high as any story that I've been involved in in 22 years at the BBC. And in all of the meetings and all of the editorial processes I've been involved in since October the 7th, I haven't heard anyone express any opinion, needless to say. We don't express opinions on any story. And I've seen any number of examples every single day of people going again and again and again at a story to make sure it's as fair and factual as, as it can be. So I don't see any evidence of institutional bias at all in my experiences. Okay, we'd love to have your comments and questions. Um, would you like to show a hand if you'd like to ask a question? Yes, sir. Uh, they're in the grey top. Um, Tissat is going to throw the microphone at you. And you <laughs> speak, in, speak into the top right. of it and we'll be able to 
pick you up on sound and camera. So. Oh, that's passing. Okay, far away. Hello. Hi. Yeah. You don't Thank need to be quite so close to it. You can take. Okay. It. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, you, I've got a question which is related to your experience as a journalist uh, uh, and a Cambridge alumnus who studied history. What is it uh, you think that academics, especially academics in humanities, uh, can learn from journalists to do better work in academia, better research and better writing about research? Thank you. Goodness, I don't know if I'd be so bold as to start offering the brilliant academics of Cambridge University any advice. It was interesting, on the, my, I got here a bit early to Cambridge, so I took a long and meandering walk here to Selwyn, past the, the Seeley Library, the History Library at uh, uh, Cambridge, which I hadn't been inside since 1996. And uh, it hasn't changed, I've changed, but it hasn't changed at all, um, which, was a, which, was lovely, which was a lovely surprise. I'd, I think what journalists are good at there are some things we could definitely improve at, of course. But I think what we're good at is understanding the centrality of the audience. If you're a radio and a television presenter, there is a really hard truth on your shoulder every second you're at work, which is if you're, what you're doing isn't helpful, isn't engaging, isn't what the audience wants, they just switch off. It's a real, like you know at any stage, when I'm making one of my videos, I always start from the point of view that no one is going to watch it, and if they start watching it, the chances are they're going to turn it off at any point. So if you watch my videos, they are written and edited to not give you a moment to think, you know what, I might do something else. They're designed to try and hold you, right? And so journalists understand that. I think broadcast journalists especially, but digital journalists in text as well now, understand that, that every moment that we're communicating, there is a risk that the people we're communicating just go. They're not a captive audience. And I think that sometimes, and I don't really want to pass judgment on, I don't work in academia and I don't study enough of the humanities output, but certainly I remember as a humanity, humanities student that there wasn't such an emphasis on that, that there was almost a slight complacency that I can be as complex as I like and write sentences that are 50 words long and generally be slightly performative about how clever I think I am, even though I definitely wasn't, um, because it's not going to cost me, because there's no consequence of that. And I think journalism really, really sharpens up your understanding that it's not just enough to have the right information. It's not just enough to organize that information well. Important, of course, though, those two things are. It is also vital that you can construct narratives and offer that information in ways that is as consumable as possible, as comprehensible as possible, and as interesting and engaging as possible. And my distant memories of academia, and again, I want to be cautious here because um, I haven't worked in academia for a long time, but my, my memory of it was there was a lot of emphasis on that first bit, which was what's the right information, how do I organize it, really important. Much less emphasis on once I've got that, how do I package this up in a way that is as easy to consume, as interesting to consume, and as comprehensible as possible. And I think journalism keeps you pretty pretty sharp on that. It keeps you focused on the audience. And so a much more day-to-day -day example would be when I write an email, I'm writing that email on the assumption you're not going to read it, or if you start reading it, you're not going to get to the end of it. Like I'm writing it because I'm, feel I'm competing, and you know, it's a bit over the top, but I'm competing for your attention. I think that's, that is a useful thing in whatever form of communication you're doing, whether it's academia, journalism, business, or whatever it might be. There are some good tips in the book about how to write emails. Um, There's a whole chapter, no less. I saw some academics paling that idea of sentences being only 50 words long. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, yes, they're in, in the... I, I should say, before the next bit, <laughs> I found, I was going through the yeah. loft the yeah. other day, and I found this kind of box of old stuff, and I found my main dissertation, which I wrote in the second year at, at Cambridge, on gender, body, and food in late medieval European mysticism. Uh, uh, so... Nothing if not a niche uh, <laughs> subject. And, the, and it, got a, it got a pretty good grade, actually. And the first page was incomprehensible. Like, <laughs> not, like I, even though I'd written it, I was just, were, what, the whole thing, I just didn't even know what it was about, really. So, um, so it, obviously, at that stage, that wasn't an obstacle to me getting a good grade. Question there. Thank you. Um, so, trending at the moment, artificial intelligence, chat GPT. How do you feel that's going to impact journalism over the next 10 years? And have you used it? Uh, 
First of all, if I knew the answer to the first question, I'd be a, a very rich man, because it's the, the, the question that everyone is asking the most. You know, if you go to any journalism conference or any journalism event now, everyone is asking the same question. And, and I always say there's, there's two answers. One is that everyone accepts it's fundamental. Everyone accepts this is an absolutely enormous development for journalism, as it is for academia and lots of other lines of work. And no one is sure exactly how it's going to work. And a lot of the work that's going on inside the BBC and all the big news organisations at the moment is not a question of, are we going to use this? It's like, of course, we are going to use this in some ways, but how do we use this and how do we set the parameters around how we use it? And then also, crucially, how do we tell the audience when we've used it? How do we label something that's been written partly by me or partly by artificial intelligence. I should say that's not happening at the moment, but we know that probably at some point we are going to be working with content that has been in part generated with the assistance of AI. So we need to think about how do we tell you when you're consuming it what you're getting. So there's a lot of work going on, but in terms of how it works, um, I'm not really sure. And no, I haven't, because for the same reason that the BBC is looking at it, but quite rightly, until it has explored it further and set parameters and set out processes and got everything lined up, we're not just freestyling. We want to do it properly, and we're going to take some time over thinking about how that, how that would work. But I don't see any scenario where we can't work with it in the same way that, you know, in the 1990s when I was coming out of university and going into the real world and Google and email and all these things, which makes me sound very old, that we didn't have when I was a student here. Um, no one's suggesting that you wouldn't use those, but you just had to work out how it, how it fitted in. So uh, the work is underway, but it's, it's, it's not going to be fixed tomorrow. It's not going to be worked out tomorrow. But um, there's a lot of work. And, and interestingly, when you get developments of this scale industries tend to work together rather than obviously we are competitive with our competitors but i think you can expect a lot of sharing of information between the biggest news organizations in the world because we're all grappling with similar questions okay just that challenge here i think we're going to go to the back row and green pull over it's just going to be quite a big throw uh, might just be a pass yeah right can i ask you to just pass it along thank you Thank you. Um, in recent weeks, we've seen really convincing deep fake audios of Sadiq Khan and Keir Starmer. Um, do you think that's going to be a bigger problem going into the election next year? And is the BBC or any of the media organisations that you know taking specific steps to address this now? It's hard to imagine where it won't be a problem to some degree because it's already been a problem. So it's only going to carry on or, or increase as deep fake technology improves kind of comes back to the point that I was making a little bit earlier, which is that because of this, the existence of this technology, we have to be cautious every time we're seeing an image coming in via social media or every time we're seeing a video. We need to pause and think, where's that come from? Can we find the original source and so on? So to some extent, it's about stopping and thinking, where's this come from? And of course, some of the time you'll go, where's this come from? And it's come from an ultra-reliable source and off you go. But there'll be other times where we can't identify that. Um, so there's a general caution that I would say already exists, but we also do have specialists who can, you know, I'm part of a new department at the BBC called BBC Verify, and within BBC Verify there are people who specialise in verifying whether, whether content is what it claims to be. And so, yeah, the BBC and all news organisations will have specialists at assessing, you know, audio or images or videos with that in mind. But the... The examples that you're raising in the last few weeks haven't been, as far as I'm aware, used by, by main, major news organisations. Like they, they spotted them. And so while they were being shared online by some people, and obviously you can argue that also needs to be countered, um, in those cases, the big news organisations did have the relevant systems and expertise to, to pick them up. But yeah, of course, it's, it's going to have to be part of our toolkit that we are constantly vigilant about where information and where, where video and where stills and where audio has come from, and we need the relevant expertise to be able to either say, yes, this is what, what it is, or, or say, no, you know, we're not confident of this. Okay, um, can we go to the black pullover um, just in front? Can you just wave your arm so Tiss, I can see where you are? There, that's right. And then we'll come down to the front row with your, your initials are MR, I take it, right? Okay, great. Um, so would you like to uh, fire away? 
Thank you so much. Hi. Um, two of the podcasts that I think are top of the charts at the moment are news, political news podcasts. Yeah. Uh, one of which um, run by former BBC colleagues of yours. And it's been interesting to see... You mean news agents? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's interesting to see how their reporting style has changed. It's a lot more informal. I think there's more of their opinions, personality, and a lot more swearing. Um, and I'm interested in your thoughts on the success of these podcasts. Do you see them as rivals to traditional reporting, or maybe you think they're complementary? Well, I suppose they're techni technically they are rivals, as in their podcasts being made you know, outside of the BBC, but the BBC has always had rivals, and that's absolutely fine. We 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 welcome a plurality of media, um, and you're quite right that John Sopel and Emily Maitlis and Lewis Goodall can do things on their podcast that they definitely couldn't do when they were at the BBC. I don't necessarily see that that's a problem. I don't see. I also don't see it's a problem that we can't do it at the BBC. I think it's appropriate that there are things that BBC journalists can and can't do, and I think it's absolutely fine that outside of the BBC, people can can do different things. For me, it's it's complementary. One of the things that I tried to do with my explainers when I was coming up with them in 2019 was I was looking around, and the biggest growth area in news video at the time, digital news video, was opinion based. Lots of people with strong opinions were sharing their strong opinions, and everyone was watching them. Great, no problem. People are entitled to their opinions, and it's good that they're popular. But obviously, I couldn't be an opinion-based journalist. So I thought, well, how can I compete when the biggest growth area is based on opinion? And my solution to that was to come up with a format where I kind of made the facts the star of the, star of the show, where I made the fact that I wasn't giving you opinion a point of difference, if you like. And you know, that went, that went okay for me. So I don't have a problem at all. That, that, I mean, obviously, it's a shame that John and Lewis and Emily were... Uh, very successful BBC journalists, and it's a shame they're not uh, BBC News from that point of view, but I don't have a problem with there being a plurality of news formats that exist, some of which the BBC can make, like newscast, some of which the BBC can't make, like news agents. It feels to me like... Uh, you're, I don't think you're ever going to find journalists complaining that journalists across the news media are making news in different forms. I mean, I think we all believe in the... Uh, plurality being a good thing and multiple products being a good thing. So it's been interesting to watch them. It's been interesting to watch, you know, uh, George Osborne and Ed Balls talk about the news from their perspective as former politicians. It's been interesting to watch, obviously, the rest of politics is very successful and that's bringing a different perspective as well. Um, I mean, they're competitors, so they keep us on our toes, but I don't think the fact they exist is a, is a bad thing. I think plurality should be welcomed. And while we're getting the mic down the front row, it is, of course, fair to say that um, John and Emily and Lewis used to work for the BBC and are now shown to be on the sort of liberal side of things, and Andrew Marr's gone to the New Statesman on the liberal side of things. It's quite hard to think of anyone who's gone to do a right-wing podcast from the BBC. Well, surely podcasts are not the only measure of what people who've left BBC News go on to do. We could, talk about, we, could talk, we could talk about Craig Oliver, who went to be David Cameron's uh, head of comms. We could talk about Guto Harry. We could talk about lots of people who have gone to work with people on the right of the political spectrum. I don't think people who have left the BBC and then gone into podcasts are necessarily a reasonable measure of whether the BBC is to the left or to the right. OK, MR. <laughs> Thank you, Ros. Um, you, you make, make a very good point about the not, not um, uh, providing opinion. Um, I found, like, you know, also trying to not provide opinion or stay neutral has become extremely prob problematic. I'm not a journalist, but, you know, in this current Middle Eastern position for a situation, for example, uh, kind of claiming some degree of neutrality or not providing opinion seems to get both sides to think that you're supporting the other side. Have you found this in your 22 years to be a bigger issue today than it has been in the past? As in, is it, becoming more, is it because there's greater polarization today that staying neutral or not providing an opinion gets people even more riled than if you were to provide an opinion? Thank you. Let me try and ask that in two ways. So within the BBC, it's exactly the same. So the BBC's culture is so intertwined with the idea of impartiality that that it it is it's deep it's understood and it's not in my experience contested so i don't find it any harder to be impartial walking into the newsroom yesterday than i did when i walked into five live in 2001 like no one's talking about their opinions if someone did or tried to exert opinions in editorial meetings like the you know the air would chill it, it's just not happening so from that perspective I find it 
the same. No one is expecting me or anyone else within the newsroom to express opinions, so that hasn't, that hasn't changed. What certainly has changed is that the audience has many more options to let us know what they think and to convey to us that they think that we are not getting it right in one way or the other. And as such, the volume of feedback you get on your journalism is you know, multitudes higher than it would have been when I joined the BBC. So when I was first presenting on Five Live and then on World Service, you'd get some text messages from people listening live if they didn't like what you were doing, and that would probably be the end of it. Now, the vast majority of the feedback that you'll get from your journalism is not necessarily from people consuming it in the moment, if you're live. It will be because something has been clipped and shared, and then as it's shared, people are either saying this is great or this really isn't great or somewhere in between. And so, yeah, you definitely have to get used to uh, a constant commentary from the internet or from people on the internet about your work. It's never ending. I could get my phone out now and show you my Twitter mentions and it'll be, there'll be hundreds there since I last looked at it when I you know, arrived at Selwyn an hour or two. So that is constant. Um, but the thing I would say, coming back to a point right at the beginning, is that journalists in different ways have always had it pointed out to that, that they're not getting it right. And you should listen to people's concerns, but at the same time, if you feel like you've done your work and that it's rooted in facts and it's rooted in fairness and all the things we're trying to do, in the end, that's the work that we're doing and you can stand behind it. Oh, we've got about 15 minutes left, so I want to make sure we get to questions. Can, can we get the mic right up to the back and you can fight between you for which of you ask the question. Just ask a quick fire one from one of our online viewers, Nigel Hurst, who wants to know, to maintain the integrity and independence of news outlets, should journalists simply be barred from expressing personal views on social media? Well, I, I, am, I mean, I don't know about all journalists, but I can't just open up Twitter now and offer a commentary on anything. I don't, I don't say anything on Twitter that's even remotely close to an opinion. And one of the simple rules that the BBC always says to us, and I completely agree with it, is that when you're tweeting, just think of it as when you're on the... If you wouldn't say it on the television or the radio live, don't say it in a tweet. And it's a, I mean, it's a really obvious thing to say, but I always apply that same rule. So uh, thanks for the question, but... Um, you won't find any opinions on my Twitter feed, I'm afraid, apart from a general enthusiasm about squash and Cornwall and a couple of things, but that's about it. OK, back row, yeah. I know this is probably quite a broad question, but would you say that its core journalism has more of an intellectual and an emotional purpose? As in intellectual, me as meaning it's supposed to like develop our knowledge of the world like to like a wider level or emotional? Is it supposed to teach us more, sort of teach us to connect with stories more? I, I don't know. Sound better in my head. What a great question. I feel like I, well, I don't know if I could write a book on it, but you could write a book on it. Um, well, I think the first thing to say is that journalism doesn't come in one form. Journalism takes lots and lots of different forms. And so it's complete, you know, you could, it's a, it's a, it's a re very broad church. But to try and connect the two things that you're saying together, for me, when I'm making journalism, first of all, I want to establish what's happened and the components within that. But there's a crucial second part, which is that I want to show how those components connect, both the, the things that have occurred recently, the new event, but also place that in context. And my job is to try and both make sure the components are accurate, but also show that the way they link together, I sh show the way they link together in a way that's coherent and also accurate. But there is a third dimension, which is connecting all of that to people's lives. And I talk about this quite a lot in the book, and you, if you've ever watched me on the telly, you'll have heard me saying this a lot. I'll quite often say, this has happened in a story, the context is this, and I'll say, and the reason this matters is, and I'll complete the sentence. And that, the reason this matters is, is to some degree what you're talking about, the emotion of it, which is that if you're sitting there watching something from, say, a different country on an issue you're not necessarily tuned into quite reasonably, it's my job to make that feel relevant and interesting to your to your life. Now, that won't always be emotional, but it is about being relevant, which, which ties to emotion, because if something's relevant, you're more likely to have an emotional reaction to it. And so uh, an extreme example I give in the book was I was sent to do the Greek debt crisis in 2015, which was when Greece was struggling to service its, its national debt. And it was a hugely important story, but for someone watching in Singapore or in California or in Leeds, it may not have felt so immediately relevant. And so my job was to say, this is a big story, here's the details and the reason it matters is. The final thing I would say is that 
a lot of my journalism is explanatory journalism, but you'll also have journalism that centers around the human experience, and that's also important. So you may have journalism which focuses on one person's experience of a particular story, say the cost of living. There have been lots of brilliant pieces of journalism which have highlighted the cost of living crisis's impact on an individual. And those are often more emotional pieces of journalism, but they're just as valid as the, the explanatory side of it, which I tend to specialize in. Um, we're going to need to move um, quite quickly to get all the questions in. Do you right, want in which to case, I'll quick? keep my yeah, answer yeah, shorter. Yeah, no, 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 that's great. You... Um, I wonder what you made of um, what you make of uh, new alternative news outlets uh, that are more sort of explicitly partisan. Um, so, for example, Navarra Media or uh, Unheard. Do you think they're the future, or do you think they're maybe just sort of uh, fringe? I think. Well, first of all, a lot of media, established media, has in its own way been partisan by its own uh, admission. It's not, not every news organization in the world would say it's impartial, and that's absolutely fine. Not everyone is set up like a public service broadcaster, and that's absolutely fine. So the idea of a media outlet having a particular position is as old as media has been. The second thing is, I think 20 years ago, when you saw a surge of, of innovation around technology and around media and around news, that a really sizable shakeup in the media, news media, looked like it was coming. And you, know, you may have, for example, seen the, the rise and then the fall of, of BuzzFeed News, for example. So for a while, BuzzFeed News had a serious imprint, and then for various reasons, its imprint decreased. And there are other examples. So I think the kind of the what looked like it could be a seismic shift in the, the makeup of the, the biggest news organizations in the world 20 years ago hasn't necessarily materialized as some people expected. If you just looked at scale in terms of audience, New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, BBC, Reuters, 20 years ago, those would also have been organizations with a, with a big imprint. However, and it's a big however, a couple of really important developments are that we can see evidence that for some consumers they don't go to individual uh, news organizations, they just go to platforms. So a lot of people will go to TikTok and they'll get news from TikTok, or a lot of people go to Apple News and get whatever Apple News is serving up, or a lot of people will use YouTube as their primary news source and they'll take whatever clips that, that, that YouTube is offering up. So the, that's, that's become more complicated as an equation. And then to your point, uh, with, with regards to Navarra or Unheard, although they're quite different operations, I mean, clearly, if we take the example of Unheard, that's proving to be a viable business at the moment, as far as I can see. There was a big profile of it in The Observer, was it, the other day, and it was highlighting the fact that it, that it appears to be uh, hanging together as a business. But we're slightly comparing apples and pears, because I think even the Tim Montgomery, who came up with uh, unheard wouldn't say that he saw it as a competitor with the the giant news organizations so you're always going to have a mix of big small medium news organizations and there's no doubt that the that new arrivals can flourish and find audiences because i think one of the things that we're seeing is that the bbc is a broadcaster and i hope we're showing this that a role for a broadcaster in the literal sense but narrow casting where you make a product aimed at a smaller audience is clearly viable for lots of people, whether it's in the digital arena or podcasts is the obvious example, where people are running very successful podcasts, narrow casting to a particular group of people. So yeah, of course, these, 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 um, uh, some of these new uh, operations are gonna hang in there. The only thing I would say is if you look across the last three or four years, it has got very tough for news operations which a little while back looked like they could be viable, but then it turned out that they weren't. Okay, we'll take a couple more questions here, and then I'm going to do to a final one online. But um, a, a row ahead, can you just wave your arm? That's right, good. Thank you. Yeah, far away. Uh, hi. Um, what can the mainstream media do to fight back against the, the populist surge that's seeking to undermine it in so many countries? That's a big question. So I think the first thing is that I never consider myself in a contest with critics of the BBC or with any other news organization. I'm not trying to prove a particular critic wrong. I'm not looking to be on the other side 
of an argument with a politician or a columnist or whoever it might be who is, is, is critical of the BBC. I think that risks being distracted from your purpose. I think in the end, you have to keep doing the things that you think are the reason you're turning up at work, the reason that you're doing this work, which is in our case, you know, to, to make journalism which is helpful and informative and fair and factual and all the things that I've uh, been saying. So while, of course, you're aware of the incoming criticisms, I'm always mindful to not bite. I don't think that's, I don't think that's my job. I don't think it's helpful. I think it's perfectly, uh, what's the right word? I would expect big news organizations to get criticism. News organizations always have. They're taking different forms as politics, as media, as technology evolves. But the idea that a news organization can exist and not receive incoming criticism is completely unrealistic. So I try and the, 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 the skill, and Roger will have had experience of this, is if people are criticizing you or they're raising concerns, you shouldn't just go like this. You should listen, because sometimes the concerns are worth listening to, are worth considering. But equally, you can't be buffeted by every last blow that's being landed on you. So a bit like the answer I gave earlier, in the end, you have to stand behind your work. And if you feel like your work is doing what you set out to do, your work is done. And hopefully people will find it useful. But if it doesn't please one particular critic or another, that's not a reason to change course. OK, we're going to come back down to the front row here and the lady in the grey here as a final question. Sorry, I haven't been there. There were loads of questions that we could have taken. Apologies if we didn't get to you. But I uh, just want to wave your arm again for Tissa. No, this doesn't help those of you watching online. But those of you here, I'm hanging around so we can carry on talking. Yeah, yeah I was going to say we, we'll, we'll come to yeah. that in a second. So, yeah. quick question that... BBC carries a lot of clout. It has a lot of weight all over the world, not just in this country. And I grew up listening to it as a child in India. So I think there is some element of responsibility which you were talking about. But what I have noticed is from being a child, bad news is always on the forefront. You have war, you have COVID, you have horror stories, everything bad. But there's a lot of good in the world that goes on. And I think the highlighting of that good is becoming less and less and less. And there are no inspirational stories for children, for young people that are highlighted as much as war. And because that's not going to stop. So do you think there is there should be some sort of change in mindset or some serious thought put into how we actually going to show good to the world mm. so that it spreads? Otherwise, it's sort of hiding behind the blanket there. You have to go hunting right, left, and center, and all you see is, oh my God, another war, another this, another that. And it's um, because you have, as I said, a lot of clout, a lot of responsibility, and you can make a lot of change in the world. Thank you. I think it's a, a brilliant and important question. You are quite right. We feel that privilege every day. I. It's a little bit cheesy to say so, but there's a piazza in front of the BBC, and when I walk in the piazza every day, the letters are up in front, and I kind of look at them and think, you know, I don't take this for granted. It's a huge privilege, and I take it seriously every day. And the issue you raise is one that we think a lot about. When people ask, and in fact, some of you have done in some ways, you know, who are the rivals for the BBC? Who is challenging the BBC? One of the answers you'll often hear from, from, from us is that, Actually, at the moment, one of our biggest rivals is news avoidance. So it's not that we're going to lose viewers or readers to CNN or ITV or Channel 4, although, of course, they are competitors of ours. Actually, one of the biggest things we're wrestling with is that people are finding the news overwhelming and they are finding that they just don't, they can't take it anymore and they're turning it off. And we take that really seriously. And you're quite right that um, finding stories that, tell of human achievement, of human successes, of, of things that have gone well, is an important part of saying to people, do keep turning on. I would say that I think the BBC is mindful of that and is doing a lot of work on that. For example, I was uh, on the six o'clock news last night with Fergus Walsh, our medical editor, who consistently does amazing science stories where he reveals the latest you know, medical breakthrough. And many of his stories are positive stories, and many of them lead the, lead the news, and so they should. It's really hard when 
there are stories of huge consequence, such as what we're seeing in the Israel-Gaza war at the moment, to not cover that story in huge depth because, of course, it's so important. So it is a difficult equation, but I would reassure you that within the BBC, and I'm absolutely certain within all news organisations, they are mindful of the fact that we do need to cover the most important stories, and some of the most important stories are very serious and very upsetting, but that it is also our job to find stories of human achievement, uh, of human progress, and the kind of things that you talk about, because if the news is only the most serious and upsetting things in our world, for some people that's not working. And coming back to a point that I was making, I think in the first question that was asked, when you make the news, you have to think about the fact that if, I know this is a really obvious thing to say, but if someone's not reading or watching or listening to the news that you're making, they're not getting anything that you say. They're not getting this story, this story, or this story. So it's vitally important that we create both single stories, but also an overall news package that works for people. And the, the, sub, the question you're raising, you know, it, it gets discussed and we're mindful of it. Um, it's a very good. Um, I am going to ask one final online question that, that came in, um, but it's a brilliant way of ending. And um, I would, as you said, Ross, we can't unfortunately say this to people watching online, but if you're here in the auditorium, uh, there are drinks available um, in the uh, on the way out. Um, also, Ros will be able to sign his uh, book, so there are some books available as well. Um, if you are able to come uh, in a week's time at Sewing, we have a session with Simon MacDonald, asking him whether he is the man who brought down Boris Johnson or not. Um, if you're interested in that, do talk to either Mike or Tissat or me, and we'll give you some information about it. And we keep doing these kind of events at Sewing, so you Do you know what the answer's going to be, Roger? I, I, well, I think he probably did, didn't he? I mean, he, it was a final moment. It was a push that um, launched... Anyway, we, we can ask him that next week. It's um, one for we... the historians in Seely Livey in 50 years' time to decide. Yeah, OK. And, and we do these events quite regularly, so if you want to be on our mailing list and come to these events in the auditorium, we'd love to see you again and back for them. Um, uh, because you were teasing me there, I'm, I am going to ask this final question from Raymond oh, Porter. Oh, great. What's this? Which came in. <laughs> Does Ross wear his usual outfit as today... Jacket, dark shirt, no tie, open collar shirt as a uniform. So in the way that other news anchors may always have worn something colourful, colourful ties and socks, are you trying to make a statement and be seen to be welcoming to a particular segment of your potential audience? Well, I'm flattered that anyone would have spent, uh, would have thought about asking uh, what I wear. There's a bit of a story actually behind the blue and the story is this. When I launched Outside Source in 2014 on the TV, I wanted to create a program that was, as I was saying, high protein, lots of depth, lots of context, lots of detail, but I wanted it to feel a little looser and more relaxed and informal than a classic TV bulletin. Nothing wrong with the classic TV bulletins, but I was trying to do something different. And I said to the bosses, I'm quite interested in not wearing a suit and tie, and they at the time, they, they, they wanted me to wear a suit and tie. So I said, OK, fine. Carried on with Outside Sores. Program was doing quite well. And in 2017, we revamped it. We redesigned the touchscreen, and we had a kind of refresh, as we say, in the TV world. And as we were about to launch this kind of new version of Outside Source, I said to the bosses again, same thing. Like, I really think it would be good if I was not wearing a suit and tie. That might help. And they said, well, OK, but what are you going to wear? Because... If you're not wearing a suit and tie and a really serious story happens, needless to say, you need to be wearing something that is appropriate for the most serious stories. Completely fair enough. So I was like, OK, that sounds, that sounds very reasonable, and I don't know anything about clothes. So I rang up a stylist that I'd worked with uh, before called Jane Field, and she's brilliant. And I said, Jane, I've got a, a challenge here, which is that, you know, they've said I can not wear a suit and tie, but I don't know what to offer in return. And so we went up and down Regent Street in Oxford Street one morning, trying on a whole range of things. And we were in a dressing room somewhere, and she just went, do you know what? I think it's dark blue. And she got a dark blue suit, a dark blue uh, shirt, a dark blue jacket, some dark blue trousers, and some dark blue shoes uh, with white soles. And she went, I think this, is, this could be a goer. So I was like, OK, let's try it took it back, did one of the pilots with this new technology and showed it to the bosses. And um, I don't remember if we had a specific discussion about it, but they didn't say no. And um, 
and off we went. But then I was kind of trapped because I felt like I'd, I'd made an agreement with the bosses to, to wear this, and so that was that. And then, uh, this is a bit of a longer answer than you were expecting, maybe, but <laughs> that's only the first half. And then the second thing was, to the point that one of you were asking earlier, when I was coming up with the explainer thing, and I thought, right, I'm going to try and make a format that competes with opinion video, and I'm going to make the facts the star of the show. I want to make the, the, the fact that this is as, as kind of high protein and fact-based as possible the thing that's the differentiator. So as a decision to help that come out, I decided it would always be the same shot, I'd always wear the same clothes, and I'd always have the same type of delivery. Because if you watch my explainers, the delivery is uniform regardless of the subject. And so all of that was quite deliberate, was to create a, a, a format where everything was consistent. And now I'm like several years into it, and I took a delivery, was it last week, of another 15 blue shirts. So it, it goes on. <laughs> That, that perfectly sums up how television works. Um, so, um, just thank you, Ross. It's Pleasure. been a brilliant Thanks session. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you very I much indeed. It. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.